Hello, my name is Bartosz Podraza. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the webinar for beginners, an overview of the programming environment Architect ALP. The webinar uh, will take around 90 minutes. So without further ado, uh, I'll firstly talk about uh, the company itself. Architect was established in 2010. Uh, we have two offices in Germany, uh, in Hanover and Berlin. Uh, our production space is located in Eastern Europe and we cooperate with uh, 21 partners around the world. Um, during today's webinar we'll be uh, using Peer200 um, as an uh, example uh, device. Of course you do not uh, need to have Peer200 uh, itself to follow this webinar um, because our um, our programming environment is uh, uh, available free of charge. Um, Peer 200 is our mini PLC. It comes in 10 modifications. Uh, the one that we'll be using today uh, is equipped with eight digital inputs, eight digital outputs, um, four analog inputs, two analog outputs, uh, an LCD screen, is, and is also supplied uh, with 24 volts DC. Extension modules uh, are available. Uh, I'll show you how to connect them to uh, the mini PLC Peer 200. Um, yes, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, our programming environment uh, ALP is uh, free of charge. Uh, you can download. Uh, you can download the. Oh, excuse me, I'm looking for. Uh, it's right here. Uh, you can download the program uh, on our website. Uh, let me just change the uh, the language to English. Uh, it's available under support downloads. Or it takes time. Uh, programmable relays. Uh, just scroll all the way down here and installation file uh, is available right here. Uh, it's a standard win Windows installation. Uh, I won't be going over uh, how to do it. I think everyone will be um, able to do uh, just that. Um, right. So let's start with the uh, webinar itself. Um, First, um, let's open uh, Architect LP and start a new project. To start a new project, click on the icon New Project and select the device that we'll be using. And uh, today we'll be using Peer 200 uh, with 12 inputs and 12 outputs. Um, using uh, Architect LP, we can always uh, uh, we can uh, program different uh, devices, but in this case, we'll be using uh, Peer 200. Uh, the workspace has appeared. Um, on the right side of the screen, we can check the connection uh, with the device. Right now, the device is connected. Uh, to the serial port uh, number six, device address is 16. Um, if the device is not connected, uh, you can always uh, check right here if the uh, if the right uh, serial port has been uh, selected. And uh, now, if you cannot, if you don't know uh, what uh, serial port serial port number. Um, um, is available, uh, you can always click uh, Windows and uh, the shortcut Windows X uh, to open Device Manager. Hmm. That has opened right here. And check uh, to which uh, serial port the uh, device is connected. In this case, this is uh, serial port number six. Yes. Um, 
the blue area in the middle, middle this is our workspace. This is where we will uh, create uh, the circuit program. Um, right here, the toolbar is uh, located. We'll be using the toolbar quite a lot. So we can find uh, a variable input blocks, uh, input and output blocks, uh, constant blocks, delay lines, and so on. Um, to the right side, uh, we'll see a library box. Library box is uh, divided into three subsections. These are functions, function blocks, and project macros. Uh, right now, the project macros uh, folder is empty. Um, the functions uh, that are available to us uh, are also grouped into uh, folders and we'll be going over them shortly. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you can see the variable box, and this is where our vari variables will be uh, located, or, or available. And uh, right now, only, uh, only service variables are available. Service variables are the variables associated with um, device hardware. Uh, in this in this very case, this will be uh, the real time real time clock. We can add uh, variables to the uh, workspace. Uh, it's important to notice that uh, service variables uh, are read only variables. We can add, we cannot uh, change them, and uh, well, they appear on the uh, in the workspace. Um, as a great input box. Uh, down here, um, we can check the connectivity, and uh, in this area, if we had any issues, the error message will appear. Display, display manager is located um, to the left side of the screen. Uh, by double-clicking double on from number one, we can access the dis display form. Um, here we can program the LCD screen of the device. Uh, the library box has changed um, and display, display and elements have appeared. Um, so we have text box, uh, input output box, and well, different boxes. Uh, I'll go back to uh, the display manager shortly and I'll explain what they uh, do in detail. Let me just um, close, close this one. Um, the pro properties window is located uh, to the bottom right uh, side of the screen. Uh, right now, because we do not have any other blocks, uh, the only, uh, well, we, we only can change the uh, properties of the main program, and in this case, that's only um, width and height um, of our workspace. I'm actually going to change the width uh, of the workspace just a little bit so that it will be easier to see um, what I'm doing. Now, if I were to add a function block uh, and click on it, um, you can see here, and uh, now I can access the properties of this block using the properties window. In this case, uh, this is a generator block uh, that generates a square function. And um, in the properties window, I can specify uh, the on and off duration, um, seconds, minutes, hours, or even days. Oops, excuse me. Now, um, I'd like to um, also show you the component manager. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, the component manager is located under File Component Manager. This is our online uh, database. Um, well, it means that the internet connection is needed. Uh, here we can find uh, different trigonometric functions. Um, 
conversion uh, blocks, like for example, uh, resistance to temperature uh, conversion block, um, PT100 or PT1000, um, different logical gates, uh, and more. Uh, I will add now um, the conversion block to the project because uh, I'll be using it uh, shortly. Uh, simply by uh, selecting the um, selecting the uh, desired block and clicking Add to Project or to Library. Okay, but in this case, we'll be adding to Project. Um, I just added the uh, block to um, my project. I can close the uh, Content Manager. Uh, as you can see now, uh, the project macros, the library. Uh, are no longer empty and here I have access to the PT1000 uh, macro. Um, right. I mentioned before um, I mentioned before the service variables in uh, architect ALP uh, we have three different uh, types of variables. Um, these are standard variables. Uh, they, uh, I mean, every standard variable has to have a name. We have to specify the data type. It can be either Boolean, integer, or real. Uh, we can uh, set persistence, persistence flag to uh, true or false. Um, if the persistence flag is uh, true, then the variable will be stored in uh, the device, uh, device's non-volatile memory and will be able to assign a default value uh, to set variable. We also have a used in project flag and a common. Uh, let me quickly create uh, three different variables. Variable one of type bool. Variable two of type integer and variable three of type real. I'll set them and set the default default value to zero. Now, and um, to add them uh, to my program. I'll simply uh, use an output block and I'll assign a constant value to each of these uh, variables. Let me just double click on the output block. Excuse me, in, uh, output block, yes. <laughs> and assign value right here. Oops, excuse me, variable. Variable. Here and variable number three. That's its type. Now um, I'm using a constant block, which means I have to specify uh, the data type. Um, the a bool type sets only values between zero and one. I mean, uh, not between, only values zero and one. The integer block to number five and the constant block of type real I'm going to set to 2.41 and connect it to the um, variable um, of block. Now as you can see the variables have uh, appeared uh, in variable box uh, to the left. We can access them just uh, by uh, dragging and dropping them uh, to the workspace. And um, each variable uh, has a different color uh, associated uh, with it. And variables of type ball um, are black. Uh, integers are orange and uh, 
clothes or reels are, I guess this is violet, purple, very sure. Um, right. Uh, we also have here the service variables. Uh, as I said before, they cannot be deleted or accessed, but uh, uh, we can store uh, the values um, in different um, variables. The service variables are all of type uh, integer. Uh, service variable integer. Click OK. And in the simulation mode, uh, which is located right here. We can see uh, all the value of the all the um, variable values. Um, we'll be talking about the simulation mode in a minute. And uh, the last type uh, of uh, the last variable type are uh, network variables. Uh, these are um, uh, variables that are used for Modbus communication. Uh, but to talk about them, first I have to introduce uh, the device uh, configuration and quickly talk about, um, well, the interfaces. So uh, right here, uh, under um, interfaces, um, we have uh, our separate five slot, which is configured as a slave. Um, here we can um, access the uh, Modbus settings. So uh, because the device has two um, RS485 interfaces, we can specify whether um, we want to use a slot number one or two. And the mode, Modbus protocol, um, a peer to hundred, a peer to hundred supports Modbus RTU and ASCII. Um, I just leave the RTU baud rate parity. Stop bits, data bits. All that we can specify right here because uh, we uh, we are now in master mode. We can add a slave. Uh, just right click on the slot number one and add a slave. We just added a slave. Um, I'm just very quickly going to add another one and enter uh, the slave. So uh, here I will change the name. Slave number one, uh, I'll leave the address thing uh, as it is. Um, and in this um, uh, in this uh, window right here, we can uh, change all the necessary settings, uh, add variables. Um, these can be of type bool into the real. Uh, we can change the name of the variable, um, uh, change the register, uh, Modbus functions for reading and writing, and so on. I don't want to go uh, too deep into um, Modbus communication um, because it deserves another, um, maybe not a webinar, but probably a video. Um, so let me just uh, quickly change the um, slave name and uh, the address. All right. Um, now uh, I'm going to add another interface by uh, click, uh, right clicking on the uh, interface interfaces tab and adding another uh, interface. Now uh, the interface number two will be configured as a slave, which means here I have to um, yes uh, put the mode on slave, I'll leave uh, the settings as they are. And in this case, um, I cannot, uh, I can only change the interface. Um, we have now uh, the slave uh, in slot number two. We can change the name, the address, change the address to number 10. Uh, we can specify the uh, register order, byte order, and add uh, different variables. 
and the valid range for the registers is uh, between uh, 500, uh, 512 and 575. Um, in snipe mode, obviously, in master mode, it's not restricted. Um, very well. Yes, uh, as I was um, as I was saying, let's get back to our variables. Oops. Let's check the uh, variable tab. I'm. Oh yes, um, that would be a good idea to. And delete the uh, modbus variable, well, the network variables. And uh, we can do it either right here. I think I also have another variable named uh, bar one in slave number one. That's right, but I'm going to get rid of it um, from the level of. Uh, variable table. Um, as you can see now uh, a different tab has appeared. Uh, here to the right we have standard variables, service variables, but now we also have uh, network variables associated with uh, slot number one and number two. Uh, slot number one is configured as master and uh, let me just delete this variable. Um, yes, uh, slot number one is configured as master and has two slaves. Each of the slaves has uh, different uh, variables. Uh, each of the variables uh, has uh, um, a name, data type, um, boolean integer or real, and uh, a modbus function associated with it. Uh, we can all obviously change the register address. And uh, in case of data type pool, uh, we can set uh, the bit, uh, bit number to either 0 or 1. Now, um, in case of a slave, uh, in, in case of slot number 2, which is configured as a slave, uh, we can only change the uh, address, data type, and obviously name. So that would be all regarding the um, variables and we can now start um, presenting the library box. Um, first I'll start with the functions um, and logical operators. In uh, Architect ALP we have uh, four logical functions that are available to us. Um, these are AND or NOT and exclusive OR. Um, I assume everyone is familiar with the concept of logic gates, um, but uh, what I want to do is to uh, show again the simulation uh, simulation mode. Um, that's why I'm going to connect uh, two digital inputs. Simply click on the uh, inputs that you want to connect. I'll connect two digital inputs and uh, with the uh, and um, function and the output of the end block with so output. Um, now to test the functionality of the program we can always use the simulation mode and as you can see now, because I have connected uh, those points, uh, the two digital inputs, uh, they have a value associated with them under the not. Um, I can start the simulation and now manipulate the inputs simply by clicking uh, on them. I can change the inputs. Uh, well, this is, this is the digital input, so I can uh, change the input from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0. If both inputs are true, the output of the uh, end gate is true as well. We'll be using simulation mode quite a lot. Now let's move on to mathematical, mathematical operation, operators. Um, we have addition, subtraction, 
division and module as well as real addition real subtraction real multiplication oops real division real power function and absolute value um uh, what i want to show you is uh how the numbers in uh architect lpl are uh rounded and uh, how to use these blocks now um well i'll use um well, addition blocks um to show it let me uh, quickly create um floating point, point value three something like this and um, another one eight point uh, nine now uh, let me uh, quickly create uh, actually I'm going to use a variable number three because it's already there and uh, the persistence flag is uh, set to true, which means I'll be able to see the value of variable free in simulation mode. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it before. Um, if the persistence flag is, is set to uh, false, then we won't be able to see the value of uh, this variable in simulation mode. Uh, but anyway, I'll connect the variable right here and I'll also create another variable of type well, integer well create just add it and what I want to do is to use conversion uh, block conversion to int uh, both of them to connect both of these values that are I remember of type uh, float and add them both together. Now to see uh, what kind of values we're going to get, we can start the simulation. And uh, as you can see, the operations uh, uh, are the same, but uh, well, when we use uh, conversion to in, integer, uh, we lose the um, the uh, well decimal part. So it's important to um, remember that the values are not rounded uh, up to uh, the closest integer, uh, but uh, we just lose the decimal part of the uh, uh, of a number. Yes. So these are uh, mathematical operators. Uh, relational operators uh, that are available for us are right here. Yeah, select. Um, these are uh, the functions that are available to us. Are uh, these are uh, equal greater than, real greater than, and select. Now um, I'd like to talk about the um, select um, block. Um, we have uh, three inputs and one output. One output, the first uh, excuse me, one input, and the first one is of type uh, bool. Uh, I'm going to connect it with my uh, with one of the digital inputs and I'll create two constants uh, two constants of type integer um, this will be well, constant two and here well, excuse me constant well will be six these are just random values. And I will start uh, 
the output of the select log in variable two is a variable of type integer. And now, uh, what select block does is it takes the uh, two values and selects one of them uh, according to the uh, Boolean input, which means if the uh, input i5 uh, is zero, then uh, the output of the select block uh, will be uh, two. If it's one, it will be six. Spend this mission. And this is exactly what, uh, what happens right here. Obviously, the uh, F cell um, or real selection um, works uh, in exactly the same way, but the input uh, data type is uh, different. It's type uh, real. We have uh, bit, shift oper bit shift operators. Um, I won't be showing how they work. Uh, this is quite, uh, I mean, uh, this is quite uh, obvious what they do. They shift uh, uh, the registers uh, either to right or to left. We can think of it as uh, multiplication times two. Well, in this system. Um, yes, that's what they do. And we also have bit operators. Um, we have encoders, decoders, and we can extract and set single bits. Um, just for, um, well, to prove the point, um, let me simply Let's say we're going to extract a bit uh, from a number. Let's say it will be um, decimal five. So decimal uh, five in binary. Oops, excuse me. Uh, in binary, this will be uh, one zero. Oh, excuse me. Zero, one. That's right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what I want to do is to extract the bit uh, from right here, which means I'm going to take an integer value, set it to five, and check, um, for example, the bit number. Well, zero. An integer, and now uh, on the output, I should see that this bit is indeed uh, one, and it is. If I checked um, bit number one, it is now supposed to be equal to zero, which it is. Um, these are um, the bit operators, and if you want to read more about uh, any of these, uh, everything is available available uh, in the manual or um, in the um, under well under um, just help me here. Uh, or we can access it, uh, access the uh, manual simply by clicking uh, F1, and we'll be able to um, access the manual um, right in here. Yes, thank you. Let's move on to. Uh, so these are these were the functions, and uh, let's move on to function blocks. Let me just do this thing. Right. Uh, under function, uh, under uh, function blocks, uh, we have triggers, 
is our uh, RS as R. This is a set reset, reset uh, flip flop or trigger uh, where uh, reset is dominant and uh, this one is the same but the set is dominant. Rising edge, falling edge and the flip flop. And now I want to just to show you quickly. I'm going to uh, connect one uh, input to the same um, to set and reset simultaneously, so that you can see um, uh, what's going on here. Uh, what, what it means that um, uh, in one uh, block set is dominant and uh, in this case this reset is dominant and this one set. It means that in this case reset is dominant, the output when uh, both of the inputs uh, are true the output is uh, zero, in this case this is one. And if I change it, it stays like this. Um, yes, uh, I think this is uh, quite self-explanatory, uh, the set reset on edge flip-flops. Um, let's quickly talk about the trigger. The trigger, um, well, if we'd like to uh, access the uh, information about the trigger, we can read right here. Uh, I quickly show you, uh, well, the trigger generate uh, pulse, we need, uh, we have different uh, inputs, zero set, read set, clock, and data. Um, as I quickly show, uh, show you how to create a, a toggle button. So let's say we have a push button, uh, like push and hold button, uh, connected to one of the uh, digital inputs. And we'd like to um, toggle the output uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the trigger every time we push the, uh, the button. Uh, to do so, I'm going to need an exclusive R gate. Oops. Let's put it right here, and I will connect uh, the clock to one of my um, digital inputs. XR gate D, and now if I connect. Uh, the output of the flip-flop uh, to the input of XOR gate, I'll get an error message. I was supposed to get one. Um, yes, uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, I need to connect the output. Uh, to a variable, yes, and the error message is uh, right here. So uh, what happens is um, now we have a feedback and uh, it is recommended to use, uh, when we have a feedback, uh, it is recommended to use a delay line. Uh, delay line uh, just delays uh, the, um, the output uh, for one cycle, so, uh, so that um, the um, so that the operations won't interfere with each other. Um, now, let's turn the simulation. And uh, please remember that if uh, if we push a button, uh, it means, uh, so what happens now is uh, now our button is pushed and now if we release this button, the input goes back to uh, zero, whereas the output of the trigger is still high. Now, if we, if we um, push again, the output will toggle. So this is, uh, I think, the most elegant way to do it to do this kind of uh, this this kind of 
operation, operational. Yes, operation and uh, I think AOP. Just that's just my opinion. Um, now let's move on to other function blocks. And let's talk about the timers. Uh, show all of them in the workspace. Clock and clock week. All right. So I think the best way to do it is to simply show in simulation what they do. Oops, excuse me, I just lost my cursor. Um, in the properties window, I specified uh, that the pulse width is supposed to be um, equal to two seconds. So, which means every time um, the block detects, uh, detects a rising edge, it will generate a pulse of uh, two seconds. Now the on, this is on delay time, let's set it to 2, and what happens in the simulation is um, I have to, uh, so the input uh, has to remain high for at least 2 seconds uh, for, the, uh, for the block to output uh, a 1. The off. Let's set it to two seconds. Connect them together. When the block detects um, a falling edge uh, on the input, it will start start timer, and the uh, output uh, will remain high. Uh, for two seconds. Um, now clock, um, actually I will just talk about clock weekly. Uh, clock weekly, um, this is well, a clock and we, where we can specify um, the dates, the, the, the weeklies. So now uh, let's consider um, a situation where I want to control an AC unit uh, in an office. And because the office is only used uh, during work hours uh, on work days, we only want to uh, turn on the AC during uh, these days. That's why I'm going to select the days from Monday to Friday. And right here, um, I will not use seconds, minutes, um, days or months, the only uh, information I need is uh, well, the uh, hours um, and um, because this is an office, so I guess we'll start, uh, we'll turn on the AC at uh, 6am, oops, I messed up, uh, we'll turn it on at 6am. Uh, and turn it off um, when everybody leaves. This would be, let's say, um, 6 p.m. Right. Um, now in the simulation mode, we can uh, change the date and the time. Oh, excuse me. I have to still connect the um, block to uh, the dig digital output. And let's turn the simulation. Now, um, <laughs> so um, not sure why um, the date is set to um, this hour, but no worries, I just change it uh, to 5 a.m. and uh, June 21st, 2021. 
and this is Monday. So now, uh, as you can see, the uh, clock is off, but when once it's uh, once it and once it's six a.m., um, the output changes to um, excuse me. The output changes to true. Now we can change the. It will remain true till um, 6 p.m. and it will turn back on at well 6 a.m. Um, next day. But what if um, what if the day was uh, well Saturday? Then 6 a.m. on Saturday, uh, the output stays low and will uh, remain uh, low during the whole day. So these were the timers. The generator we have already used, uh, well, I have already showed the generator once, but um, so let's see how it works. I'll connect the input um, I of the generator. And the output to the digital outputs. Um, in the properties window, um, I'll set the up duration to two seconds and the on duration to uh, two seconds as well. Now, I'll start the simulation and the generator creates. Uh, Two second pulses. Well, yes, two second pulses. So um, the uh, so it generates a, a square wave with a period of four seconds. I would like to show you now is uh, write and read uh, function blocks. Write function block and read no, function block. Um, let's say I'd like to. Um, access the variable that is stored uh, as of duration right here in this block. I'll use the read from function block to do so. In the parameters, uh, in the parameters, uh, well, excuse me, properties window, I'll specify that uh, I'll be using, uh, I'll be reading from um, a function block uh, blink1, this is the generator, and I'll be reading parameter of duration. I will store this value in a variable of type integer and I will change the on duration period using a constant block. Now uh, first I'd like to uh, start the simulation before connecting this, uh, this block. Um, to show something important, and um, so the um, the argument uh, of this uh, well, well the um, the argument of this uh, excuse me the variable start in here is uh, of type integer, and it is in milliseconds, which means uh, because I've set uh, the uh, off time to be two seconds, uh, so two seconds in milliseconds, uh, well, it's equal to 2,000 seconds. Now, if I want to change the uh, the on duration, I have to put here a value in milliseconds as well. Um, I'll change it to one second, thousand milliseconds. And uh, remember that I haven't changed the uh, well, anything in the properties window, but if we go to the simulation and start it, the T on value has changed now and is now set to uh, one second. Uh, it just means that uh, write to function block has a higher priority uh, than the properties window. Of the call uh, regarding the generator. Let's 
get two counters. I have three counters. Special hand counter. So, all right, uh, universal counter with self reset. Let's um, set the value here to about five and connect the input uh, right here. Now, uh, if we start the simulation, um, you can see every every single time uh, the block uh, recognizes a rising edge um, on the input, uh, the uh, value of t changes, and once the t reaches the uh, reaches uh, well in this case five or n, uh, the pulse has been sent. Uh, is sent. So let's do it again. Three, four, and now a pulse uh, um, is sent on, uh, on the out output. Um, so that was that. Now uh, the universal counter. Uh, the universal counter. I will set to five as well. And I'll connect three different inputs. Oh, excuse me. Um, right. And the output of this block is of type uh, integer. So let's use this uh, variable. Now, um, if I um, change the input i every single time um, it will increment the uh, value um, q and every single time uh, the input d is true well the um, the rising edge uh, on the input d is detected uh, the value uh, goes down by one now, if I reset um, the block, the default value uh, is number five, which means uh, we specify the default value in the properties window and um, using the pulses, um, we can either, uh, we can change the uh, output value. And now the last one. This is a threshold counter with a reset. Simply put, once we reach five, we change the uh, uh, state of the output. And to reset it uh, back to the uh, default value, we have to um, well, reset it use, using the input R. That will be all. So these were the counters. And now let's get to the PID controller. Um, I won't be discussing the um, I won't be talking about how a PID controller works um, because that would take way too much time. Um, I will simply uh, show um, how to use it. And um, in my um, in my example, I will be controlling um, will be controlling the temperature of uh, a fluid in a tank which means our process value uh, will be the temperature. Um, but first, before we uh, get to a uh, PID block, first I want to talk about the analog inputs. Now, the analog inputs uh, we can configure in the device configurator. Um, 
uh, we can work. Uh, they can work in uh, modes either uh, either analog mode or uh, digital mode. In our case, this will be analog. And we can use different signals. These are uh, current signal between 4 and 20 milliamps. Uh, resistance signal between 0 and 4,000 ohms. And uh, both signal uh, between 0 and 10 volts. And when we use uh, uh, signals, a uh, current or uh, current or voltage signals, we have to uh, specify the lower and upper measuring limit, which means lower measuring limit is uh, the value that corresponds to 4 milliamps, and upper measuring limit corresponds to 20 milliamps. Uh, we can change the analog filter. And that's pretty much it. In this case, I'm going to use uh, as an input signal um, a signal between 0 and 4000 ohms uh, because I'd like to connect a uh, uh, PT1000 sensor to this analog input. Um, yes. Um, I hope you can remember um, that I have added um, PT1000 conversion block, which I will use to um, change the value, uh, to convert the value of the resistance into the temperature. Now, uh, PT1000 block has two inputs and two outputs. Um, I connect the analog input. Um, to uh, the input R. For W, this is Y resistance because uh, I'll just leave it, um, I think I could leave it uh, not connected, but because this is only theoretical, I'll assume that uh, Y resistance is equal to zero. Uh, I will store the temperature in a variable and this time I'll create a new one. Of time trail, persistence on. Oops. Temperature. Very well. And now um, the error. Um, the error is uh, so the, the error output. It's an indicator. It, uh, if the error, the error, the, excuse me, <laughs> if the error is equal to uh, zero, um, then we're good. If the uh, if the error is equal uh, to one, it corresponds. I mean, it error. Answer, excuse me. That's right. Um, uh, so again, if the error is equal to zero, it means that. Uh, the uh, resistance value is in the valid range. If it's equal to one, it means that uh, the value is below the valid range. And uh, if we uh, have uh, number two right here, then the value is above the valid range. Very well. Um, now let's simulate. Uh, uh, well, you let's use our simulation. Um, Simulation tool to check what's what's going on in here. Uh, the valid range uh, for P2000 um, in this case is uh, in between uh, 185 and 3904 uh, ohms, which means on the input we now have zero and the error is equal to one, which, which means we're below the valid range. Uh, uh, by clicking on the input one, uh, I can change the value. And uh, just to prove the point, uh, I will set uh, the resistance value to 1000. And the temperature is equal to zero, which is true because we're using a PT1000 sensor. Um, I just change the um, 
value right here to 1050 ohms and on the output we get 12.8 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, now that we have a process value, this is the temperature, uh, we can now uh, work with the uh, KD controller. Right, um, the KD control, controller um, has two control modes. These are either heating or cooling. Um, now, what it means is that uh, uh, what it means that well, heating. What it means um, heating uh, means that if the um, process value is uh, lower than the set point, and um, the controller will try to. Um, the, the, when the um, output of the controller uh, rises, uh, the process value also uh, will rise. Whereas in uh, in case of cooling, when the output of the controller rises, the uh, process value uh, will drop. So that's the difference between um, heating and cooling. We'll be using heating mode. Uh, output safe state, this is the output uh, of the controller when the uh, controller is off. PP, PI, and PP are constants. Now I'd like to uh, quickly show you uh, the mathematical form of a PID controller um, to avoid of confusion because um, I've seen people um, using constants KP, KI, and KD. And uh, in Architect ALP, we use TD and TI uh, instead of uh, KI and KD. Um, they're basically the same. Um, KI and KD are respectively replaced by KP divided by TI and uh, KP times TD. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind because sometimes um, someone wants to, would like to because, for example, let's say someone uh, derives a uh, control equation, uh, wants to uh, wants to uh, tune the PID, um, changes the value of TI, and gets a completely opposite response than uh, uh, desired because, well, um, they are basically um, well inverses of uh, each other, so this is something to uh, keep in mind. Oh, excuse me, I have forgotten um, as well. Uh, so let's go back to analog inputs uh, uh, just quickly. Analog inputs, um, we have different uh, modes. Uh, these are, and we have this, the different signals that we can uh, measure, um, but uh, it's, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, have, uh, so the input, the analog inputs have to be um, have to be uh, configured uh, in such a way that if we want to um, measure um, uh, measure, for example, uh, a voltage signal, we have to remove the uh, front cover and set the jumpers associated with uh, point XP1 to these positions and. Um, uh, all the information is uh, available available in the uh, manual. Let's get back to PID. Um, yes, so these are the constant, derivative constant, integral constant, and proportional factor. And we can also limit uh, the outputs. Uh, I'll limit the. I won't limit the the. the uh, inputs and output. Oh, excuse me. I won't limit the output at all. And now, so because I already have a temperature, um, I could add this temperature right here so as my process value. And the thing is, I'm not going to. 
um, mostly because it will prove very difficult to um, um, to set the process value exactly to uh, the value that I want. This is why I'm just going to create a new variable called process value of type real. process value and I will connect it uh, to analog input uh, number two and we'll pretend that this is the temperature of my uh, of my tank now the process value will be connected right here and I will I'm going to um, Set the set point of type real as well to let's say 70. It will represent 70 degrees Celsius. And the output will be stored in a variable of type real called dwr. Oops, it's not w. PWR. PWR L will be um, in between 0 and 100. Now, uh, my output set state uh, I'll leave at 0, or actually, I will change it to 5 because why not? And um, now, um, here uh, I can get to manual tuning. I'm just going to guess the values, um, just to so you know it, they do not mean anything. I just want um, to show you how the PID controller works. Um, so uh, right now we can start the simulation. And because the um, uh, PID controller is off, and my output, uh, my output save state uh, was equal to five. That's why uh, we can see a five um, on the output. Um, process value is equal to zero. I'll change it in a second. Let's just, and as you can see, if I uh, start the controller, um, it well, it behaves. Uh, now, accordingly to the um, uh, to the constants that I've chosen. Now, if I change it, um, uh, so now when I change the value of the pro uh, the the, the, the um, analog input value, um, there will be a massive change uh, happening really quickly. That's why. Uh, that's why the output goes to zero very quickly because this is the der derivative term working and now if i go to um, let's say 68 uh well the controller well does a job but uh, let's consider a situation when we don't want to and tune the controller manually. I want to do? Uh, want to um, go through the process of auto tuning, which is very convenient. So, um, yeah, let's get to it. We'll need um, write the fun function right from function block block, and we'll specify um, the function block p and d. And we'll read from it information about calculated uh, value of Kp. Um, Kp from C, maybe calculated Kp, right? Um, right here we'll add as well calculated Ti. 
change the value of it here and calculate it T B. They all have persistence. Um, just uh, oh, just let's get back to it. Um, I'm just checking persistence because I want to see all of these uh, values in the simulation. Um, it's not that uh, the controller wouldn't work if the persistence wasn't checked. Um, it's just the simulation wouldn't work if I didn't do that. Um, um, so, right. Um, let me just add another blocks. And this will be LKD and TD calculated TD connected with this one ID. This is TI. So I'm just going to use calculated TI and here. Oh, let's keep calculated. That's good. Okay. Um. Now using using write to function block. KD. And I will say start auto tuning. Um. I will connect it with digital input number one. And yes. Uh, now we can start. Uh, so um, the auto tuning works in a way. Um, so in this way that uh, it calculates the constants. Um, if the uh, process value is lower than the set point, it applies uh, well maximal. Uh, it applies 100% uh, on the. Uh, controller output. If it's over, then it drops back to zero. Um, what it uh, what happens then the uh, process value uh, fluctuates and crosses the uh, set point line. Um, the controller then uh, determine, uh, determines uh, the constants and uh, yes. This what happens. Yes, yeah, so let's start the simulation. And uh, just note that the values that we're going to get are um, are not true by any means. We're actually not even using a physical system. That's why it's just to uh, demonstrate how the uh, auto tuning works um, and how to how to use it. Uh, so we'll start uh, auto tuning using write to function block, and now if we start the um, if we start the PID controller, we should we should see uh, 100 on the output, which it is. Um, now it will stay this way until the um, set point is crossed. So if I to 65, it's still at 100, but if I go to 80, it drops to zero. Uh, now I have to cross the uh, set point uh, line several times, um, because uh, right now we still have our uh, uh, the, the values that I have uh, written into the block earlier. Uh, so we're at 60 now. Go back to 80, 60 again, and now uh, the values have changed. And um, yes, and the uh, and the controller uh, operates as intended. Well, as intended. Um, now um, it's also important not to not uh, to uh, remember that if we uh, that uh, it's good to uh, excuse me. Uh, now it's really a good idea to write down those values and uh, punch them into 
um, the uh, properties box so that if anybody ever uses this uh, program uh, there will be no confusion uh, whatsoever. Right. Um, I don't know what um, time it is. Oh yes, uh, I'd like to talk uh, just um, as the last part of this webinar. I'll quickly talk about the analog output. Analog outputs um, are not configurable um, because every uh, device has um, one type of analog output. Uh, in case of my device, uh, which is built 124.4.2, um, as analog outputs, I have uh, uh, two. I have two analog outputs uh, that output uh, voltage signal between uh, zero and ten volts, uh, which is why, uh, if someone wants to use the analog output, and let's say. I want to use analog output to control a heating element, let's say. Um, and I'd like to use the PWR uh, value. Um, then we have, uh, and then we have to change uh, the input of the uh, to the analog output so that it lies between. So the lies between uh, 0 and 1, which means um, if I were to use the digital output, excuse me, analog output to control anything, then I'd have to uh, select my um, my um, variable PWR, go to functions, uh, mathematical, mathematical operators, find wheel division. And use a constant block of type real 100 right here. Um, so that PWR um, lies between 0 and 1. And oh, um, yes, so right now it's 0, uh, 0 0.05. Um, and so, uh, yes, the um, Zero corresponds to zero volts, and one corresponds to ten volts. Um, I hope I have talked about um, well, everything we're supposed to cover uh, during this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, thank uh, everybody who took part um, in this webinar, and. Um, Yes, I hope you'll stay with us and you found this uh, this webinar interesting and useful. Uh, I wish you everybody a great day. Um, stay healthy and, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much and bye. <laughs>